So our first speaker uh, is is uh, David Roberts. He's going to be working with Denny uh, Werner, who most of y'all know, former director here and the introducer of Ruby Falls and Whitewater Red Buds and Blue Chip uh, Miss Ruby uh, uh, Butterfly Bush and all kinds of things. So um, a really good uh, background with, uh, with uh, some of the plants that, that we're, we're real proud of here that helped introduce at least. Um, David is. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree here at NC State. Uh, went on to do his ma work on his master's with, with Denny. He spent some time working with Tom Ranney up in up in the mountains. Um, you'll, you'll hear that several times uh, tonight. But before that, he came from the the North Carolina Arboretum, the Arboretum at the, the other side of the state, uh, working with the the bonsai, which is um, kind of a, a real interesting uh, shift from bonsai into. The, the plant breeding world. I guess you keep it small when you're looking at the, the genomes, that sort of thing. Um, so David is, is working uh, just strictly with red buds, uh, looking at the, the inheritance of morphological traits, um, like the purple leaves, the weeping, all those sorts of things. Um, and he's conducting a chlorophyll analysis of the yellow leaf cultivars, because there are several of them coming out now. Um, I'm not going to try and get any more because he's getting beyond me. When you start getting small like that, I uh, I, I, I get lost. So, David Roberts. Thanks, Mark. Well, thank you all so much for having me. I appreciate this chance to talk about my research. Um, as Mark mentioned, I've been working with Dr. Warner for the last two years, and I've been very fortunate that I can utilize some of his advanced populations as my research material for my thesis. And as he mentioned, my thesis involves three parts. Uh, one of those is a genome survey in which I've uh, kind of tried to quantify the genome size of more than 30 different packs of red buds. The chlorophyll analysis, which he mentioned, of two different yellow leaf red bud cultivars, um, just to try and determine what it is that makes the yellow leaf cultivar look yellow. Um, and then the inheritance of morphological characteristics, in which we try and determine and explain how it is certain traits of red bud are passed on from one generation to the next. So I think most of us are familiar with red bud. It's a native, obviously. A lot of variation, eastern red bud, Circus canadensis specifically, has a whole lot of morphological variation that you can find in it. Beautiful flowers, <laughs> a wide range of uh, morphological types as far as the leaves go, lots of coloration. You've got dwarf and weeping forms, the upright varieties, of course. Of course, the spring flowers are always lovely. Um, but with all this variation you can see in Circus canadensis, there's absolutely no documentation as to how these traits are inherited and passed on from generation to generation. So Dr. Werner and I sought to remedy that. This inheritance study utilizes a lot of his advanced hybrid populations, and with those, we can kind of tease apart how some of these traits are passed on. And some of those traits that I'll talk about tonight include the purple leaf phenotype of forest pansy, the weeping architecture of covey, and the yellow leaf phenotype of hearts of gold. So to start off, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the purple leaf inheritance. But before I do, I need to talk about a little plant known as Ruby Falls. Some of you guys might be aware of this. It's a beautiful purple leaf weeping red bud. We've got a lovely example of it here at the JCRA. This is a plant that Dr. Warner released about six years ago. But the families, the plants that he used to generate this hybrid are extremely informative when it comes to determining the inheritance of both purple leaf color and the weeping architecture of this wonderful plant. So how did he do it? Dr. Werner had a green-leafed weeping cultivar known as Covey. He had a purple-leafed upright <coughs> cultivar, Forest Pansy. And when both of them were in flower, he isolated them into a pollination cage, released a whole hive of bees, and just let them pollinate to their heart's content. From that, he eventually got some seed and generated a population of about 23 F1s. Now, all of these F1s, every single one of them, were green-leafed and upright. And this is significant because it tells us that that implies probably purple leaf and weeping are both inherited in a recessive fashion. If either one of these traits were dominant, we would see that expressed in the F1 generation. So since we're not seeing that, probably recessive. But Dr. Werner needs his purple weeper, so he has to take this to the next level. So he takes the F1 populations and allows them to intermate in the field. All 23 plants allowed to cross-pollinate via natural pollinators. He harvests the seed from all of those plants and grows on the plants to the F2 generation, which he has about 1,500 of. So this F2 generation is where the magic occurs. A certain percentage are going to look just like mom, a certain percentage are going to look just like dad, but a very small amount, 1 16th of this whole population, is going to be both purple leaf and weeping. And that's how Dr. Werner got Ruby Falls. It is a 1 16th 
percentage of the F2 population of cubby by forest pansy F2s. So this population is really important because from that we can determine what would be expected. So if you take this 1,586 plants and you apply simple Mendelian segregation ratios to that, you would expect four different phenotypes to occur in this kind of a ratio. So in a perfect world, this is exactly how it would happen. You would get this kind of a perfect distribution. And this is what we actually received. So as you can see, we got pretty close. We had a slight underrepresentation of purple leaf plants, but that's actually something that you can witness in several genera. So we weren't too concerned about that. But in order to prove our hypothesis that these are simply inherited and recessive traits, we had to do some data analysis. And that's just a simple matter of running a chi-square test. Um, we basically look at the ratio of green leaf plants to purple leaf plants. And running a chi-square analysis, we see that it does indeed hit the 3 to 1 ratio that we were expecting. And so based on that data, we can say confidently that purple leaf color in red bud, at least forest pansy, is inherited in a simple, recessive manner. And because no one's ever documented this before, we actually get to name the gene that is responsible for that. So that's pretty cool. We got to call it PL1, purple leaf for you know, purple leaf one. And uh, we got to do the exact same thing with weeping. We'd use the exact same families that we were used to generate Ruby Falls and the, the purple leaf inherited study. We just analyzed them for architecture instead of leaf color. And so we analyze the amount of non-weeping plants to weeping plants. It hits the three to one ratio that we were expecting. So just like with the purple leaf, we can say that the weeping gene in Covey is inherited in a simple recessive fashion. And we got to name that gene also. So pretty cool. So far we're two for two, everything's going well. Now, Dr. Warren wants to get a golden weaver. So he's got Covey and he's gonna cross that with hearts of gold. This time we do it in a greenhouse so we can better control the pollination movement. And once again, he generates a population of about 37 plants, and all of those are green and upright. Again, we expect them upright because, you know, weeping is recessive, but the fact that all of these are green means that yellow leaf is probably also going to be a recessive trait. But Dr. Werner needs his golden weeper, so we take it one step farther. We take the F1s, intermate them, collect the seed, grow the seed on, and get to the F2 generation, but this is where something weird starts to happen. <laughs> We did get the green and the gold that we were expecting to get. However, we also got some weird variegated mutants. Wow. Yeah, yeah right? But how do you judge that? Do you call that gold? Do you call it green? Like, how do you score that? <laughs> yeah, so we uh, also recovered some bleach phenotypes. And these are the guys that really threw a monkey wrench into the work. So these all proved to be lethal in the field. We call them bleach because they're not quite albino. They're completely lacking chlorophyll, but they did still have some of the yellow pigmentation that we think is left over from the hearts of gold. But because we got so many of these guys, it really threw off the expected segregation ratios for the gold and plants that we were getting. So we were really expecting to get more of the gold than we actually did, and we believe it's because of these bleach phenotypes. But because of that, we can't use this for any kind of statistical analysis because it's not matching any of the known Mendelian segregation ratios. So, what we did was we actually combined all of the gold and the bleached into a single category called golden bleached. So we took all of those plants and pulled them together and compared them to all of the green plants. And when we did that, we actually hit a three to one ratio every single time in every single family. So that's pretty interesting. That kind of implies that these bleached individuals were gold leaf segregates that experienced some sort of a genetic modification that completely disabled chlorophyll production in those individuals. Now, this is uh, interesting, but it would actually require a lot more experimentation in order for us to actually prove that. And unfortunately, I'm about to graduate, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> but um, more than likely, this is a result of transposable element activity. Now, transposable elements are also known as jumping genes. They're pieces of mobile DNA which can actually reinsert themselves into the genome of an organism, thereby altering the genetic function of whatever gene it's inserted into. This results in some really unstable phenotypes. So, as I mentioned before, we had these 50-50 leaf variegations. Unfortunately, none of them persisted. Every single one of them grew into a green leaf tree, which is unstable and kind of suggestive of transposons. This is one of those green individuals that shot out a single orange or yellow branch, which is interesting. But this was one of those bleached individuals who actually did begin producing chloroplasts, which kind of implies that maybe a jumping gene inserted itself and reestablished the production of chloroplast in that individual. It still perished, it got toasted in the field, but it's still interesting that something like that would happen. So, unfortunately, we don't have any concrete evidence as to how the yellow gene is inherited, but more than likely, it's going to be recessive in nature. 
Um, so just to kind of give you guys a little bit more of the findings that we had, um, the purple leaf color that I mentioned in forest pansy <coughs> is actually another purple leaf red bud called burgundy hearts. And its, yellow, or its purple leaf is caused by the exact same mutation that forest pansies is. So they're two different trees, but the mutation for purple leaf is the exact same in those. There's two trees, a red bud, that are weeping, traveler and covey, and those are actually caused by different mutations. There's a double flowered one. We have flame right outside of this building, actually. And its gene is controlled by a dominant gene. So that's interesting. There's two variegated red buds, silver cloud and floating cloud. We got those on premise also. Those are both the mutation that causes variegation. That's caused by a different mechanism in the <coughs> plant. So in floating cloud, it's maternally inherited through the cytoplasm. In mm. silver cloud, it's actually a nuclear gene that's causing that variegation. And then finally, once again, the yellow leaf color that we recovered in Hearts of Gold and Rising Sun, it is likely the result of a transposable element activity. We can't say for sure, uh, but more than likely, it's also going to be a, an entirely recessive gene, a single gene. So, uh, like Dr. Warner said, unfortunately, you can't know everything, but sometimes half the fun is in the mystery. So, it's been a, a fun journey in trying to figure some of this stuff out, and thank you guys for letting me dis discuss it with you. The um, Ruby Falls, mm -hmm. the seeds, is it true to seeds or do you have, you know? Well, you would have to get a Ruby Falls mated with another Ruby Falls in order to get a true to seed. So okay. um, through subsequent you know, breeding efforts, you could eventually recover another one. But if you've got like a Ruby Falls in your yard and you take a seed off of it, it's probably not going to be equivalent. Does that make sense? Sure. Any consideration of crossing the purple with the gold? That is actually a great question. Dr. Warren has already done that, and we've got those trees in the greenhouse right now. He has the Ruby Falls crossed with Rising Sun, and so just like you can see, that I get back there. Um, just like with this one population, that we had you know nine three three one segregation. Um, you get a certain amount of the percentage of the population which is going to have both purple leaf and weeping. You know. I would think a half purple, half gold would be. <laughs> see, that would be yeah. nice if you had the extra. Okay, so right here, you see how this is the 1 16th that have both purple and weeping? So 1 16th of the population that Dr. Werner has is going to have both the purple leaf character and the yellow leaf character in the same plant. And that's being expressed in three different ways in the greenhouse right now. Some of them are gold leaf, some of them are purple leaf, and some of them have this amazing red tone that I've never seen in any red bud before. It's almost like a ball red. It's really striking, and it's going to be a game changer, I think, when he releases it. And he'll have that in both an upright and a weeper, because he's got the ruby falls in the background. So. How, how stable are the colors in the heat? I know Forest Pansy loses uh, right. a lot of heat. So that's something that we're still trying to figure out. We just got these trees in the greenhouse right now, so it's just a matter of getting them into the field to trial them. More than likely, purple's going to be fine. It's going to respond a lot like Forest Pansy does, be purple and then kind of green up towards the later part of the year. The yellows seem to be very stable, don't have any problem there. Uh, we're not sure how the reds are going to perform because they're just in the greenhouse right now, but we're confident that they're going to do just fine. Not going to burn out. That's exciting. Yeah, I think so too. Thanks. Yes? Um, so I'm going to use that more recently, but I'm just curious about the sequencing of the seeds for the it is possible, yes. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I didn't mention it, but he actually has that already. He does have the golden <coughs> leaper. Yeah, he's actually got it from Hearts of Gold. He's got a golden leaper coming from Rising Sun. And he's going to have a golden leaper coming from this Ruby Falls Rising Sun cross. So he's actually got three different possibilities for a golden leaper. Right now he's trying to decide which of those three is going to be the most viable as far as economics goes. So, that's a good question. Yes? I know you've done, looks like everything with, with leaves and everything, but I have a, uh, have you done anything with white blooming red buds? I've got a white blooming red bud. We, yeah, we actually had white flowers, uh, I believe it was Alba, that we were studying as part of this study originally. Um, and we had some really good data that seemed to suggest that it is also controlled by a single recessive gene. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough population, enough populations to verify that right now. So that's something else that could be determined through uh, future studies, but uh, as of right now, we just don't have the hard data to prove it. 
but more than likely, it's just like the purple leaf and just like weeping. It takes a single or a double recessive gene to get that into an organism. So if the yellow trait is so unstable in the crosses, how, how is the actual cultivar that it originally came from stable? That's a great question. Um, there's actually you know, two yellow leaf cultivars, Rising Sun and Hearts of Gold. Um, we believe they're both caused by the same mutation, and both of them seem to be stable in their native states. You know, they're both propagated by the tens of thousands, and every single propagule comes true to form. So there's absolutely no seeming transposon activity in that, but every time you get some kind of recombination of genes with that cultivar, either of the yellow cultivars, you get all sorts of weird stuff happening. So even with rising sun, when you cross that to anything else, when you get to the F2, you get all sorts of weird stuff happening as far as segregation ratios go. So that's a really great question. I don't really have a, an answer, but you know, transposable element activity is still kind of here on me. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on how that's working in our cultivars. It's something that we just kind of figured out as we were going along. But again, that would be a great research topic for someone who's got a little bit more time. <laughs> right. Questions? Yeah, eventually says weird stuff because I'm like, okay. <laughs> sorry that I, I don't understand it all. Weird stuff is, uh, is, is getting on more on my level in here. I'm, I'm waiting for the, the, the red leaf, weeping, double flower, white. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one. You know how to do that now. That, that sounds pretty cool. Maybe we'll hear more when Danny comes here to, to speak. All right, next yes. speaker. Is uh, Laura Caterbeck? Did I say that right? Cataravic. Cataravic. Oh, there's an extra name. Cataravic. <laughs> um, comes to us from uh, Wisconsin, where she got a degree in music uh, performance. So uh, coming at it from a little bit different angle. Uh, she moved to North Carolina in 2007 and rediscovered her passion for plants and nature. It's because she could see them when they weren't covered in snow. <laughs> That's exactly which inspired, right. <laughs> <laughs> inspired her to return to, to school, uh, came to NC State uh, for a bachelor's degree in horticulture and graduated in 2014 and went and worked with Tom Ranny for seven months and got a real education. Um, <laughs> with his plant breeding and came back to Raleigh to, to start working on a master's degree. She's working with Brian Jackson and Bill Fontenot in the, the Substrates Lab, which is really one of the premier, maybe the premier Substrates Labs in the, in the country and, and possibly the world. It's really um, top notch. So um, Laura's going to be talking about uh, some research on the aging of pine bark and, and how that works in, in substrates for growing plants. So, Laura. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you about some of the research I'm doing in the Substrates Lab. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is, why would you want to work with substrates? You know, it's not very glamorous, there's not a lot of pretty plants to work with, but um, really, we're like Atlas. We hold up the weight of the horticultural <laughs> world. <laughs> Without a good potting mix, um, you wouldn't be able to grow a lot of the plants that we all love as well as we can. And so a lot of times, you know, when you're in the greenhouse or in the head house, opening up the bag of potting mix, or if you, you know, just got a bag from Lowe's, you expect that, you know, you can just put it in the pot, you can use it, things will be fine. But as you can see, this is not always the case. Um, sometimes Depending on what's in the substrate or what's not in it, you can have very drastic um, results in terms of plant performance. So horticultural substrates are a soilless media mainly comprised of organic constituents. Um, of familiar examples are peat moss, coconut fiber, um, pine bark, even some wood fiber. Um, but being organic constituents, they are affected by four main parameters, uh, such as processing and handling of the materials, uh, the microbiology, how it is aged, um, if it's aged, or how it is stored, and the chemistry, not just chemistry such as pH or um, EC, but things like hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin. And so while some of this is understood for a lot of the organic media, um, not all of it, there's still a lot of questions that 
uh, need to be answered about how it can be best utilized in potty media. So the most common uh, substrate used here in the South is pine bark. It is a waste product from pulp, paper, and forestry industries. Um, it comes mostly from loblolly pine down here, and it is more readily available, renewable, and affordable than peat. And because it's a local product, uh, it greatly reduces transportation costs. So here's a video about how the whole thing works. Uh, the bark is removed from the trees, and then it is brought to the mulch supplier on a big truck, which is kind of unloaded and moved into a huge pile. And so then what happens is they take the raw, unprocessed material and put it into a grinding machine, which helps uh, reduce the particle size and break down any of the uh, large items that might be in there, which I will show you in a few slides. And so once it's ground into a smaller particle size, then it will go through a screener. blue thing coming in here is a screener. Um, you can kind of see that there are three different piles that will come out of it. Um, so once he loads that load of um, the ground bark in there, it will be split up into three different um, size fractions. There's going to be the large particles, which will end up being um, a mulch go back over yet. And then there's going to be a finer type mulch, and then this is the fines which will be used in potting media. So just kind of a more close-up shot of what those products are. This is the raw bark. Um, for size reference, that's about 10 centimeters there in the bottom, but there are particles or fractions of the bark that are much larger than that. And sometimes there's fun things in the raw bark, like giant pieces of wood, um, tree limbs, huge logs, those all get ground up and then um, become potty media as well. So this is what it looks like after the raw material is put through the grinder. It's still a fairly large particle size and it's not something we would want to use in a potty mix at this point. So these are the three products that come out of the screener. Um, there is the large mulch, there is the medium sized mulch, and this is where the magic happens. This is where we grow all our great nursery and greenhouse crops. So some of the questions um, that exist around the use of pine bark are, do you, can you use it fresh? Do you need to age it first? Or should you compost it? Um, so using it fresh, you use it right away, uh, just out of the screener like that. You put your plants in it. But there are issues with particle size and splinters. It's still very much a raw product at this point. Um, and it, Depending on the tree species you use, it could also be toxic to seedlings. Aged pine bark is stored in uh, open air stockpiles or very long, large windrows. And aging time can vary uh, depending on the supplier or even the weather conditions. It can go from six weeks to 18 months or more, um, depending sometimes too on the, you know, people, if there's a high demand for that material, it could go fast. If it's low demand, it can sit out there for a long time. Um, and with an aged media, no fertilizer additions or pH adjustments are made. It is not um, you know, sprayed with a hose. It's kind of just left to the elements. And so composting is um, probably the most optimal way to do it uh, with carefully controlled conditions, addition of fertilizer, regulation of pH, moisture, mo bleh, moisture and aeration. However, uh, this is often um, more costly for the supplier. So it's not uh, often what they do. So here in the south, um, aged pine bark is usually the way we go. Um, but there are issues with aged pine bark. Uh, nitrogen immobilization, which is where the microbial population of the pot mix will take up the available nitrogen, which means that the plants can't use it. Um, so this happens in materials that are wood-based with a high carbon and lignin content. Um, and as you could imagine with the uh, slides and the videos I showed you, there are a bunch of ways to process it and age it and lots of combinations. And so would you want to process it before aging, leave it out to age in a small particle size, or do you want to age the raw materials for a period of time and then break it down? Um, there are no parameters or guidelines in place for pine bark aging. 
Um, every supplier does it differently. Uh, it's very difficult to be able to assess or predict nitrogen fertilizer needs, and nobody knows when it is ready for and optimal for use. Uh, it's kind of a guess. And so my thesis research, uh, which I've just started, so I don't have a lot of data to show you, but I'll still give you a big overview of what we're hoping to do. Um, is there a better way to model and predict nitrogen mobilization in pine bark potting media over time? Um, is there a way to know where we are in the aging process so we can understand what the optimal point is for use in growing medias? And could there be a better rapid test for predicting nitrogen mobilization and the exact amount of fertilizer needed so a bark supplier could come to the lab and just know if it's at the right point for being used within you know, a day turn over time? So my research is going to take place, or is taking place, at TH Blue, which is a pine bark and mulch supplier out in Eagle Springs. Uh, this is my research area. I have three piles that have been processed first and left out to age, and then this will probably not be part of my research, but will be a continuing project in the lab, is we will compare the results from this to uh, these piles, which are left out to age raw, and at six and 12 months, they will be processed into finer particles. So my project is pretty interesting because not only do we get to use um, tests that we commonly do in the substrates world, but we get to pull from soil science, um, microbiology, and we're even accessing some uh, resources in food science. So we'll be looking at the physical parameters, such as um, temperature, pile temperature, uh, pile dimensions, moisture content, um, bulk density, particle size, etc., and looking at the chemical parameters such as pH, EC, um, elemental content, cation exchange capacity, uh, the lignocellulose, tannins, phenolic content, etc., and <coughs> also the biological parameters such as incubation experiments where we get a greater understanding of the microbial uptake of nutrients and uh, seedling germination tests to understand the phytotoxicity of bark at different ages. Some of the um, novel things we're doing are involve sensory parameters. Uh, when I was out talking to the owner at TH Blue, a lot of times people, when they come to buy the bark, they don't know exactly what they want, but they know the color of the media they want, and they know it by the smell. And so if it doesn't smell right or if it doesn't look right, they don't want it. But these aren't really things that are easy to quantify. So what we are going to do is use a Munsell soil color chart to try and accurately predict color parameters over time to see how the color correlates to the optimum usage of the material. Um, we're also going to be work, working with the sensory analysis lab over in food science to understand how the volatile organic compounds um, affect the smell, and we're going to use um, gas chromatography olfactory measurements. Another uh, approach that is becoming more widely used in all sorts of science sciences, but especially um, in the potting media area, is uh, near-infrared reflectance spectroscopy. Um, it measures the near-infrared light reflected from a sample illuminated with light of all wavelengths. Um, the radiation is absorbed by different chemical bonds and results in uh, bending, twisting, stretching of the bonds. Um, the mix of absorption peaks are correlated to wet the wet chemistry analysis, which we will already be doing and is done on the same sample to create calibration matrices using a linear regression program. Um, the reason it's being used so much and why there's such great interest in it is because um, it's non-destructive, very high throughput. Um, if you have a good calibration model, you can just put it in the machine and kind of know where it's going to fall on the line. And we can use it to, uh, it's been used to measure pretty much everything that I discussed in the previous slides. Another cool thing that we're doing uh, to measure the temperature changes over time is thermal imaging. Uh, we're just kind of getting started with this, but this is kind of an interesting tool, not only just to understand how it heats up from a microbial perspective, but also um, a lot of times these can spontaneous combust if they're not turned or aerated enough. Mm. And so right now what suppliers do, they'll go out and they can just smell it. They, there's a certain smell that lets them know when the pile is going to start on fire, but they're hoping they can just go out with this, get the temperature, and then they can know that it's time to turn. 
And so um, the bottom picture is interesting. Uh, the microbial activity in the pile will heat it up from the inside, and that's how it um, ages and how the composting process begins. And so we dug a hole into one of the piles, and you can see how much hotter it was on the inside than on the outside. So by correlating all of those properties, the physical, chemical, and biological parameters, along with the new novel approaches, we are hoping to get greater understanding of all these parameters um, and how to utilize potting media or bark in potting media um, in the most optimal way. So with that, I'll take any questions. People who come out to get the bark and they know by their sense of smell or, or uh, the look of it, and y'all you're looking to kind of quantify what, what that is. Is there do different folks come out and have you know different smells that when they say it's it's right and how did how does that how do you utilize that that information? Um. Yeah, people do come out and they have different and it, sometimes it's the same material, but if it's just it can change based on if it's been um, aged first or processed first. So what I think we want to do is kind of make a chart with that and kind of talk about where those colors came from. And so we're going to look at that in both piles, the aged first and the processed first, and um, make a chart. And then the suppliers can use it to kind of show, like, oh, well, it falls into this color range. You know, this should be good to go, even if it's not quite the color that you're hoping for with your material. changes in weather and precipitation and stuff, it seems like it would be really a mess to figure out what was causing it. Yeah, um, that is definitely very true, and also uh, the time of the installation of the study. Um, what we're doing too, and I forgot to mention it, is um, there's a weather station nearby, and so we're going to have detailed weather information for the whole course of the study, which we will also um, put into our analysis of the data we get. Or how, how soon will uh information from the study be available? Uh, within a year. Um, I started collecting data last month. Um, it's going to run, um, my particular part is going to uh, be a year long, but so that will be available um, hopefully spring 2017, but it'll be an ongoing thing too. So. Do you know why the uh, local landscapers are having trouble, landscaping supply companies are having trouble getting the uh, ground pine bark? Because none of them are carrying it right now. And, uh, the only way to buy it is in bags, which is kind of crazy. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I knew there was a shortage of pine bark. I do think it's being used more for other industries at the moment, and it's being used for um, fuel production effort as well. Hmm. Uh, there's a question that's sort of off the grid, I guess, but I have just a little selfish motive behind it. I do a lot of planting, you know, pop, pots and whatnot. And I go to Lowe's, and I'm going to buy it. They've got tons of stuff there. What, 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 what's up? What do I need? What, do I, what should I need? What's the best investment you know, um, bring back home? I'm not sure how to answer that question. We actually did a study in the lab for a very well-known um, potting media supplier that I won't name. Um, but all the materials from their different plants around the country produce different results, even though it was all being sold as the same product. Um, so there, <laughs> there's a lot of variability in the materials that you can't necessarily um, predict or plan for. But... Yeah. <laughs> there's something else today, you guys just experiment, I guess, and put different mixes together and see what it produces. Mm -hmm. So with your research, are you mainly just going to be focusing on when to tell when it's just right to use the media, or are you just trying to, like, or are you going to try and focus on ways to actually keep nitrogen in the media and keep it nutrient rich, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or are you just trying to determine when? Um, well, it's kind of both. Um, we're looking to determine when, but we're also just looking to get a greater understanding of how this all works in general. Um, there's not really any research that's been done to monitor changes of it over time. So hopefully with that information, we will have a greater understanding of how to keep it nutrient rich and um, what the best way to process it and age it is to make sure that it provides the best nutrients without um, too much additional fertilizer.
Oh yes, that is definitely one of the questions we're looking to answer because um, even from the same supplier, like I said, you can get a range of different products. And so um, TH Blue, who we're working with, they really want to create a more consistent product. And so that is definitely one of the main goals of this. Do you already know any cases where there are pine bark plant toxicity issues? In other words, do you already have some species that you know are going to work okay, or you suspect will work okay, and some that you know should have some toxicity issues, so you can get some comparison? Yes, there is. Um, unfortunately, I'm blanking on the species right now. I do know that most of the southern pines that we use are not toxic to seedlings. Mm. Um, and, and interestingly enough, um, Pinus taeda that's used in Australia is toxic, but for some reason the Lavalli pines that grow here are not, so that is mm. confusing. <laughs> Do you have a good indicator species, a species that you use as a test plant to put into the different media because it's more sensitive than most, so it will tell you faster what's happening? There's actually some discrepancy in the literature about that. Um, there's also some discrepancy <coughs> to whether seedling tests are the best for pine bark because they're not often, it's not often used as a seed starting mix. Um, but what they do in um, most of the research is either cucumber seeds or cress seeds. Um, and one test we're doing that goes along with that is the um, North Carolina Mulch and Soil Council grow test, and they require um, marigolds, tomatoes, and radishes. So what we're doing are tomatoes, marigolds, and radishes for um, the actual grow test where we put the potting media and mix it with sand and put it in pots in the greenhouse. And for the uh, aqueous germination extracts, where you take uh, liquid extract of the media, we're using uh, cucumber seeds because that's what's most commonly used in the U.S. So is your work separated by um, potting media and then mulch? So yeah, I'm not dealing with the mulch. You're not dealing with mulch. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing um, focusing on the uh, potting media. Would you be able to determine the useful life of the of the media? And, you know, that needs to be changed and changed out. That's a good question. Um, I don't. I won't be looking at that. But I we would be interested. Uh, the lab would be interested in um, understanding. Uh, storage properties too. Um, I know that we have done it in the past for other um, potting media suppliers. We've looked at the performance of the same media as it's just been stored in bags for three, six, nine, and twelve months and then made recommendations. This may be off the wall, but does the pine bark beetle have any effect on the chemistry of the product? It can. Um, one of the, um, I forgot to mention too, I'm actually drawing from entomology a little bit and trying to understand uh, the volatile compounds that make up the odors, and uh, yes, the pine bark can slightly, in, or the beetle can slightly influence the um, volatile organic compounds that are in the pine bark. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Master students. We're going to finish up with a PhD student. Uh, Jonathan Cresson is uh, working in the tomato breeding program. I know we here at the Arboretum talk a lot about the ornamental breeding program here at NC State, but we're actually, NC State's one of the, the top uh, institutions for breeding a whole range of vegetables, uh, agronomic crops, kind of all across the board, including, including tomatoes. Um, Jonathan's working with uh, Dilt Panthe uh, and Frank Lowe's in plant pathology. Mm -hmm. uh, he comes from New Mexico. I have to talk about where you're from, that's where I'm from. And, and he got his degree at New Mexico uh, State University. Uh, came to, to Raleigh to work on his master's degree in horticulture, um, looking at genetics and physiology of uh, southern bacteri bacterial wilt resistance in tomatoes, uh, tomato rootstocks. And, uh, looking to continue uh, plant research for the rest of his career. So uh, Jonathan's going to be talking about his work with grafted tomatoes, which just, it always still amazes me that you can graft tomatoes, um, for disease resistance to Ralstonia sol... I won't say the last part, but it's not our Ralston, it's a different Ralston. So, um, really interesting work with, with uh, uh, grafted tomatoes. Great. Well, uh, thank you all for coming out to listen. Um, I hope that uh, you don't mind the 
stuff, but I mostly just have to keep track of myself so that I don't talk you, your ears off. I have a tendency to do that. Um, to answer Mark's question, I come from a little town of Los Alamos in northern New Mexico, um, halfway up the mountain peaks. So I had you know, the river down at the bottom, of that, uh, and then I grew up on a series of mesas, beautiful vistas. It's just wonderful. If you ever get the chance to visit northern New Mexico, I highly recommend it, and uh, especially in the fall, because we have a very unique s uh, smell for fall. Um, it's when the green chilies come roasting all over the state. Uh, that's just a very special time. Um, but I'm not here to talk about chili. I'm not here to talk about New Mexico. I'm here to talk about the uh, second most important vegetable crop in the world, and that's tomatoes. Um, so as was mentioned, I work in the tomato breeding program. Uh, my focus is less on the breeding, more on the genetics and understanding the, uh, the, the disease and the physiology and the interactions between the tomato and the pathogen. So that's what I want to give you a little bit about. I, I finished my master's working in, in this area, and now I'm continuing on to the PhD. So I'm really excited about this, pro this project. I'm really enthusiastic about it, so I hope by the end of this, you will too. So when, whenever we think about plant diseases, I always think of it in terms of all-out total warfare, um, especially when we start dealing on the molecular level and the, and the cellular level. That's, you know, humans are not as barbaric as, as plant pathogens are when it comes to war. Um, so we're dealing with tomato, so Solanum lycopersicum, as well as over, it is over 200 different species and over 50 different plant families, can be pathogenized by this little bacteria that lives in the soil called Ralstonia solanacearum. Um, if any of you heard, it, it, it causes the disease southern bacterial wilt, um, but also if you've ever heard of, um, it causes wilt, the same wilt in geraniums, uh, it causes moco disease of bananas, it hits peanuts, it hits, um, it, it hits pretty much all of the solanaceous family. Um, it's a, where, where it's present, it's a very substantial economic problem. It lives in the soil um, for decades. There's no, crop rotations don't really help us with it. And then the pathogen enters through the roots and gets into the uh, xylem tissues within the stem where it uh, mass produces uh, itself and produces a bunch of basically uh, slime and degrades the xylem tissues leading to a irreversible wilt. Um, this is what it looks like in the greenhouse between a inoculated versus not. Uh, this is a common case of what we see in the field. Here's a field that we do a lot of research in for my work um, up in the mountains that have, we get very strong disease every year, and that's about that's about what the that's what the field looked like a couple of weeks ago. I'll be heading back up there tomorrow. Um, so it's you can see when you have when you've got a problem with it, it is devastating. Um, and so I want to give I just want to go into a little bit of the uh, more of the principles of when we're dealing with plant disease research, things we have to keep in mind. Um, you, some, for most of you are probably familiar with the concept of the disease triangle. And the idea is that disease is actually a, uh, the result of the interaction of environment, pathogen, and susceptible host. And you have to have all three in the right place in order to get disease at all. You, you start messing with one or the other and you can stop your disease. That's how, that's how we think about when we go to manage diseases in tomato and in, and in anything else. And so my work is focusing on changing the susceptibility of the host so that we no longer get disease. Now the way we're looking to do that is by using um, a grafted production system. Basically a grafted plant is just like you would in, have in a grape or an apple or, or any of those other uh, tree fruits where you have one variety is your scion, the top part, or the leafy part, and then that is cut off from its roots and placed upon the root system of a different variety of plant. Um, and so we, we don't really do this much in the United States, uh, but vegetable grafting um, is, is for, for these annual crops that we grow is actually very, um, is used very, very frequently for a lot of the major crops in uh, Asia, particularly Japan, um, Korea, Taiwan, those places. They do a lot of vegetable grafting. So the U.S. is just starting to get into this whole thing. And so vegetable grafting, um, when, we're trying, when we're looking at managing disease, um, we always like to think of it as a, as a, we're working with a system of strategies with a bunch of tools in our toolbox. And grafting affects 
um, the grower knowledge and experience tool, the growing system, crop selection, and of course, genetic resistance. So those are the aspects of our strategy that are being affected by, graft, by our grafting system. And I really like this project that we've been working on because we work very closely with a lot of tomato growers and, and uh, um, members of the tomato industry um, around, in, around the, the whole southeast in this project. And so really, um, we have this very nice arrangement of we as scientists um, go to them and, they, and hear what, what they need and their, and their practical experiences. And those help guide our research questions. And then we can then take our um, research into basic understanding of biology and genetics and, um, and the environment and then put it right back into practical solutions. So it's a, it's a, it's a very nice feedback that we have as um, part of our land grant system and how we're doing research. And this, this project is very typical of that. So I just wanted to give you a background on vegetable grafting as a whole when we're doing with, dealing with tomatoes. So we work with seedlings, usually between the two and four leaf stage. And we very literally just take the, the uh, one variety, uh, or our rootstock variety, we decapitate it, and then decapitate our cyan variety and uh, place it right back on the other one. We use a, this is called the uh, Japanese top graft method. And it uses just this little silicon clip to, um, to hold the two parts together. You know, in woodies, you often use like grafting tape or you put like some kind of wax or something along it. Um, so this is basically our, our tape and wax. Um, we usually use do a 45 degree angle that helps uh, give the most amount of surface area for the healing process. Then once we have successfully reunited two different varieties, we put them into a uh, chamber that has um, dark condition and high humidity because we want to keep the plants alive so they can heal. And then over the next seven days, we wean them off of the, wean them back to light and then wean them back to humidity. And we actually do, these, do this in the Fox greenhouse on campus with the uh, fine overhead mist. And we get very good success doing this method. It's not the only way that works, but this one is what we, we tend to do. Uh, then here's what it looks like um, after the seedling has started to be hardened off and it's healed, you get this bulb of callus growth and a nice uh, connection, all, you know, the water um, conduits and sugar conduits are all become reestablished and then the plant is ready to go into the field. And, uh, when, most of the time, you know, when a plant, when a seedling gets put into the field as a tomato seedling, it's about six weeks after it was sown. When we do our grafted plants, it still is right around that six to seven week window. So we only really slow up the plants in about a week. Um, so it works very well and, and is very amenable to our current tomato production method so systems. So then, let's, let's talk a little bit about the uh, actual, um, how we're helping plants grow in the first place. And, and to overcome this battle with this very deadly pathogen. So we've been using... Or previous work has established that there are resistant tomato varieties to this disease. And that, but the, pr the primary problem that we're, and the reason we're doing grafting in the first place is because when we try to breed the, these resistant lines with our, our standard, large fruited, nice tasting, at least if you grow it at home, tomato variety, um, the more we, we get that variety to be large fruited, the less and less resistance we get. There's a very, very tight linkage in the genome um, between small fruit size, indeterminate plant growth, and some other um, poor horticultural traits with the actual traits for resistance. And you know, breeding programs all over the world have been trying to break that linkage for over 50 years. And to my knowledge, there's only one variety. <coughs> of, well, there's, there's still no variety, but there's only one selection in, by the University of Florida that is in the process of potentially doing this. Um, so the idea is, well, if we can't breed the resistance in, let's bring it in by grafting. We can, that way we can have a variety that has good roots, um, you know, a strong root system and has resistance, and we'll just put our susceptible but nice fruiting tomato on top. So we do this, and, but, and we want to find out, well, there's a lot of different rootstocks that we could use, which ones work best for North Carolina, and which ones work best for different regions of North Carolina. And so that's what this data is uh, addressing. This is some work from my master's project where we took um, several, okay, nine to ten um, different um, tomato rootstocks, all with various levels of resistance to bacterial wilt. And on that, we put the um, large fruit variety, Florida 47, very popular um, in the southeast, also highly susceptible to Ralstonia. And then we put it in a very heavily diseased 
field. That field I showed you before that was very decimated, that's where these, these trials happened. And uh, then we assessed them for their wilt incidence over the course of the season. At the end of the season, we took uh, yield out of each of our plots. And so this is what we, th we found, is that um, these two blue lines here um, were our controls. We had a non-grafted and a self-grafted, just to very basically make sure that having that healed graft wound doesn't increase your, your sensitivity to the disease. And it turns out it, it really doesn't. Um, and then we had a couple of rootstocks um, that proved to be highly, highly susceptible. Some that fell in the mid-range, and then we had four that uh, showed actually to be, only have no more than 10% wilt in this study, which is actually really good. That, that's, that's enough to be qualified as highly resistant. Um, when, we did, when we did some statistical comparisons, we found a very um, nice grouping of these lines um, as very distinctly Obviously, I mean, you can just, it's, it's obvious from this graph just how much more resistant they are compared to these. You know, the high, high disease um, presence, very, very low disease presence. Then when we looked at the yield from these, we also found that that Florida 47, that susceptible variety, that the yield was somewhere between 25 and 35 tons per hectare. It's pretty low for tomato production. You'd, you'd be hard pressed to, uh, to make any money out of that, that kind of a situation. Um, but then we found that, our high, that we had some root stocks that were pushing upwards of um, 60 tons per hectare, which is, which is really good yield for a tomato field. Um, and, we all, and it turns out those are ha just happen to be the ones that are highly re resistant. We would expect that. Now there's also an interesting thing, you know, when you start dealing with grafting two varieties together, is sometimes you can get crosstalk between the roots and the cyan and vice versa. That sometimes you can have some synergy happen where it gets even better when they're together. Um, as a lot of times we find in the fruit, fruit trees, or sometimes it can be a negative interaction. And I, what I wanted to highlight here is that we have uh, two varieties, these two um, Hawaii um, lines, that right where they were all in this less than 10% category, but they're, uh, they only, the, the, the yield from them was the same as our susceptible controls. Thinking, well, what's going on here? We don't really know, but that, but that demonstrates that not every disease-resistant rootstock is best for our tomato production systems in, in North Carolina. And that was, that's really good information to know. Um, but, you know and further research is going to have to figure out what's going on there. So then one of the other questions I had already mentioned was, how, what about different regions of North Carolina? We have the mountains, the Piedmont, the coastal plains, different levels of water, different soils, different temperature ranges. And you can find bacterial wilt the whole length of North Carolina. So do, do some rootstocks perform well in one region versus another? So what we did is we actually took some unique uh, bacterial isolates from, the, from one from Pender County and one from Jackson County in the mountains, and we put them, it did an inoculation experiment in the greenhouse to, with basically all these rootstocks, one got one isolate, one's another, another set, uh, a duplicate set got the other isolate. And what we found is, once again, we found that all the rootstocks that performed very poorly in the field also performed very poorly in the greenhouse. The ones that did okay were okay, and those that, um, uh, that did well in the field did pretty well in the greenhouse. We had a little bit more there, but that's just because you know, I, was just, I was just dumping billions of bacteria on those plants. So it was very high pressure, um, but they still performed pretty well in the greenhouse. Um, and that's, that's important, that's helpful because sometimes you, your greenhouse inoculations and your field studies just don't really line up, but at least with this pathogen, we can actually uh, predict the field by what we see in the greenhouse. Um, and so then this graph, it, it, it looks kind of complicated, that's just because we have a lot of varieties. Um, the basic story is we did not see a differential response between the one isolate or the other. Um, some look like they're yeah they're, they're kind of close, but statistically they're they're all um, identical between the isolates. So that's good. That means that what we recommend for um, the coastal plains, we can also recommend for the mountains and vice versa. So at, I just want to give you a, a a little bit of a take home feel for how practical vegetable grafting really can be for disease problems in North Carolina, um, and that is described by. This photo. The, this is a, a, a very well-known tomato grower in the Piedmont who has um, acres, and he grows over 300 acres of tomatoes every year. 
And he has several large fields that are just full of bacterial wilt. And every year he's losing 40, 50, or even more percent of his crop. And uh, so when he heard about grafting, he said, oh, this, I'm going to try this. So what he did is we did a, we, he, we helped him, we did a side-by-side -side study. Here are um, the same variety in the same bacterial wilt-ridden field. The only difference is this was not grafted. This was grafted on a wilt-resistant rootstock. Um, and because of this research, he this past year he put in 30 acres of grafted tomato plants. I mean, that's millions of tomato plants. Um, and uh, he he's really happy with it. And, and that's just, and I mean, this is in a lot of ways going to save him his tomato business from these fields. I mean, it's just a, just a that just makes me that's just a take-home message that I just makes me feel good when I go to bed at night. <laughs> um, I just want to give you a little taste of what I'm doing, some of the things that I'm doing in the PhD. Um, we want we're interested both in management of the disease on a practical side, but we're also interested in advancing our basic understanding of what is the biology and genetics and the interaction that's happening in these resistant plants. Because they tend to be very, they're very interesting, <coughs> at least to me. And so one of the things that I'm looking at is alternative ways to assess the disease in the plant. Um, one of the symptoms of the plant, you know, it gets into that xylem tissue and it causes a, um, a brown necrosis in those xylem tissues. And so I was chopping up plants one day and saw, hey, these, these all look different. There's some variation between one variety and another, and there seems to be some association with how it wilts. Um, the other, and so I've started looking at that, and one of the things I found is generally the more resistant lines have, um, or are on the lower end of the browning scale, which I'd expect, and then the, but there's, it, it's curious to me that some of you know, these one, two, three, four particularly varieties that are highly resistant as far as wilting goes, still tolerate a pretty moderate amount of, of necrosis in their stem. So the question is, why? <laughs> you know, because even though they're resistant, the pathogen always is still able to, to colonize into the zones. So I'm trying to tease apart these disease physiology aspects. Um, and so that's, that's some of the things that I'm looking at as, we go, as I go into the master, or the PhD. And um, hopefully uh, I'll get some disease in my fields yet, and I'll be able to start answering some of these questions. Um, but thank you for listening. I'm open to any questions if you've got some. Right. Um, it, it, uh, oops. It, it does look a little bit psychedelic. <laughs> yeah, that's really nice. But you know, as far as maybe you mentioned this and I kind of missed it. The, the guy who was growing all the tomatoes. What is that grafting due to the cost of production? It doesn't increase it a lot. Or? Yes. Uh, the primary cost that it increases is the, is the cost of that transplant seedling that goes into the field. Um, most growers, you know, they just buy their seed, they have their own greenhouse spaces, they grow their own transplants. When you're dealing with a grafted plant, A, you've got to buy two seed. You have to buy double the amount of seed, so that can get kind of costly. And particularly, a lot of these rootstocks are still in low enough demand that they're kind of a specialty market, so their cost per seed is actually rather high. Um, and then there's, a, there's the labor cost associated with actually doing the grafting process before so there, yes, it does add some upfront costs, um, but every year it seems the cost is coming down. It's kind of like computer systems and, and uh, DNA sequencing. It's just going down every year. Um, when there was an economic analysis done back in, I think, 2011, 2012, and that priced out a grafted plant at about at just over a dollar a seedling, versus a not your, your standard non-grafted is right around 17 to, to 25 cents per seedling. So it is a substantial increase in cost. Um, now, um, since more growers are doing this, some of the nurseries have started picking up on, hey, we, there's a market for the grafted plants. The cost is coming down to uh, more like 60 to 75 cents. But if you're losing 40 or 50% of your crop, suddenly those, the, that cost doesn't look like much. Um, and in some of our assessments, uh, we've developed a matrix of if you have, if you expect to get this much yield, and you expect your market price to be this much, here's basically your break-even point on whether or not it's economical to use grafted plants. Um, 
Um, so we're, yeah, we're, we're definitely looking into a lot of those things. Good question. Laura? So the, um, the grafted plants that you showed that had the um, produced the best yield, can you buy those rootstocks? Um, you know, that combination, is that something you can purchase or do you have to custom request it or is that information you can really out and being used yet? Well, the, um, that is a good question. Um, Probably the best one. So, um, Chaeyang Gang is a seminist line. Um, you can request it, though I don't usually see it in the receipt catalogs. Maybe it's just because it's not in demand enough to be worth putting in. Um, but if you talk to a seminist rep, uh, you can get that. Um, this RST04106, that's D Palmer seed. Um, CRA66 is actually an open pollinated public line where you can, it's, you can save seed, it's true. <coughs> Um, was actually bred from the University of Florida. Um, so we actually maintain the seed repository for that. Um, these Hawaii lines are also open pollinated public lines, and these have been the most resistant around the world for close on 50 years now. Um, nobody's ever really been able to top these two, though they tend to be a little bit more wild, which I think is why you get some of that reduced production yield as a this kind of the, the plants tend to fight a little bit, I think, um, just because of that wild, more wild nature. Um, but yeah, there's several companies that have these, and uh, you're not going to be able to find it from like here. So you actually have to go to the supplier themselves. One that you see is Maxiflor. Can you mm -hmm. see that in the catalogs? But you're saying it's not resistant. Right, um, Maxiflor is not labeled as bacterial resistant, and so. We basically put it in the study initially just to verify that, as well as it's really a, we use it as a, a susceptible rootstock control. We'll have our scion control and we'll have our rootstock control. Um, but yes, Maxi Ford is really, is a, the most popular tomato rootstock, um, and it has some good resistance to Verticillium race 1, Fusarium wilt, some of those other soil born. Um, but when it comes to bacterial wilt, it gets in there. Um, yeah, Maxiford is generally used um, for its just, it, it should, it, the plants are obviously have a greater vigor when you put them on Maxiford. Um, that's the primary reason. A lot of times we actually see that, you know, it, it, some study, the studies are a little bit inconclusive. Some say that you get a yield boost, some say you don't. Um, we have seen it's, um, cases where Maxiford just tends to produce a more jumbo size fruit, which you can get a premium price off of. Um, but generally, it's, it's grown for its bigger, especially with the heirlooms. Mm -hmm. What would happen if you would take one of your grafted plants in the uh, fall, put it in a greenhouse, and just keep whacking it down till springtime and then replanting it? Well, um, I suppose... Obviously on top of the graft. Right, 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 right. You definitely don't, don't want to right. totally eliminate it. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I've never done it, but I would expect that um, you're going. You, you would be able to maintain it um, in the greenhouse uh, you know, over the winter. Um, you'd have to be real careful about bringing in you know, insects and other pathogens from the field, um, and uh, you definitely wouldn't want to put it under a, a light source. Um, I suppose if you want to put in the work for it, then you could do that. Yeah. I would say there's other diseases that would probably get it. Uh, <laughs> other than this particular. Right, especially when you put it in the greenhouse, you really got to deal with worry about thrips. Like I'm always fighting thrips in the greenhouse, and because you know, they, they vector tomato spotted will. And I hate that. <laughs> I just hate them. <laughs> you say the bacteria is in the soil and basically stays there forever. Right. But the pictures that you were showing, the um, wilted plants look fairly large. How long does it take for wilt to affect the plant, and will an affected plant then affect those that are near it, or is it mm. only coming from the soil? It's a good question. Um, the bacteria lives pretty, pretty um, effectively in the soil year-round. Um, it's native to North America, <coughs> at least this particular race. Um, when you have it in a field, it can affect at any stage from a couple weeks after planting all the way up till you're in the middle of harvesting and then suddenly the plant collapses. Um, a lot of it depends on um, 
the, well, the primary environmental factors that affect that are the soil temperature and then the air temperature. Uh, those, those, are, those are predominantly the drivers of the disease. Um, we most often see plants really go down to wilt when they start swelling the fruit, you know, when it really gets a heavy fruit load on, um, mostly because the mechanisms that are, you know, the energy that would be going to the resistance is suddenly going into all the fruit, and that's, we, that's about the time we usually see the greatest collapse, which is also why it's so economically damaging, because you put all those inputs in, and it's, you're about ready to harvest, and then crash, 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 and then, you know, in a matter of a week, you can level your field. As far as transmission from plant to plant, um, a, an infected plant is not going to transmit through the air to another plant. It's not like some of the other um, foliar pathogens. However, um, it does. The plant, an infected plant, will leak bacteria back into the soil. So, you know, if you've got a lot of water movement down, your, like down a tomato row, you can spread it that way. Um, but usually, it tends to be in the soil in an infected plant. It doesn't usually go like a plant through the root to another plant. But like if you grow hydroponically, that's a that's a major major issue, and they've had those issues in the United States. A couple more questions. We'll go with you first, first sir. Uh, so evolution is unstoppable. Um, you start filling up these infected fields with resistant plants. Are the bacteria going to start evolving to become more successful than the more resistant ones? Are you worried about that? We are always worried about that. <laughs> that's part of the reason that we are. Um, excited to see that we have multiple rootstocks that tend to do pretty well because one of the questions that I'm currently trying to address in the PhD is how unique is the resistance in rootstock A versus the resistance in rootstock B aka can we use different rootstocks in like a genetic rotation of resistance or are they all from the same source and we're going to build up resistance that's one of the questions I'm trying to answer right now um, yes when, you come, when it comes to a pathogen you put resistance in the field, you're always going to be selecting for um, the, the population to be more and more able to overcome the resistance. Um, soil pathogens, tend, that tends to happen pretty slowly. Um, and so we're all, you know, the, the, the genetics that make up the resistance in tomato also tend to be, um, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not a single gene, we've got multiple genes involved, they all contribute a little bit. And so that also tends to contribute to the durability of the resistance. Um, so we're always looking for it. We're always trying to get ahead of the pathogen in that regard. Um, but thankfully, you know, this one is a little bit more tame in that regard. Uh, I've read about a uh, big facility going in up at, uh, I think it's Mills River. Yes, right there in Henderson you involved with those folks? Mm -hmm. Um, we are very, very excited. There's a, uh, a grafting, a vegetable grafting facility coming going up right in Mills River, North Carolina. Um, that's actually a merger of several um, Asian and European grafting companies that have come together to put a facility in North Carolina. They think the market's the market's finally ripe, and they're going. They're actually they've they've broken ground. They're currently building, but they they anticipate that they'll be ready to have grafted watermelon for the spring and grafted tomatoes for the summer. So I'm, re I'm really excited. I'm hoping I can just send my seed to them, and they'll do all that work, and I don't have to do that. <laughs> uh, but yes, they're very excited. We're very excited to have them. Chemical treatment. Chemical treatment, yes. Um, the re there is effectively no chemical treatment that works. Um, you, all of our growers fumigate their soils. Um, it tends to basically knock back the bacteria, but by the end of the season, it's as if you've never fumigated. And there currently is no effective chemical control for this pathogen. Yes, I haven't heard anything about taste. How do, how do the grafted tomatoes taste? Well, um, I cannot say that I have fully trained my tomato palate to be able to tell this soil versus another soil like, like, like they do with grapes. Um, but we have found that the quality remains um, as though it were not grafted. That's, that's as much as we've been able to tell. We do, we do work with, uh, a little bit with um, um, Dr. Perkins down in Kannapolis doing the, the post-harvest work and, and some of those assessments. And the, as much as we've been able to tell, um, there's no drop in quality when you use a drop in quality. 
Well, there's a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> you, you just mentioned watermelon as a crop, and I never heard of that one being grafted, and tomatoes is pretty new to me, too. Right. And I have a horticulture background. <laughs> Do you know watermelon other... is also the, other, the next upcoming yeah. grafted vegetable as well. You got any other it's plants? tomato, and then it's watermelon. Um, they, they try a little bit with um, uh, cantaloupe. <laughs> um, that one hasn't taken as well. The, the, the market just isn't quite um, there um, to really need grafted um, um, cantaloupe. Um, in the United States, that's about all we do. Um, in Asia, they graft their cucumbers, they graft their watermelon, their cantaloupes, their eggplants, their tomatoes, their bell peppers, um, partially because they don't have the space to be able to do effective crop rotation, so they're putting vegetable after vegetable after vegetable in the same area, and they can grow them longer, and it's a lot of indoor coverage. But yeah, in Asia, they do a lot more than we do here. Cool. Thanks. Or you had a question. Have you done any research in your research? I mean, have you done any research in the sand hills area? Sand hills. I personally have not, though a colleague of mine has done some um, nutrient uptakes, uh, well, nutrient studies working with grafted tomatoes to see if some of the rootstocks um, require more nutrients, require less nutrients to get your optimum yields, things like that. Um, so he's, he's done some work there, yeah. You had a question? In the south, we're recommended to plant a second plant, you know, second planting July or so because of this. <coughs> but if you take a cutting from one of the healthy plants to mm. root it for that, mm. then it's, it, that would be... Well, that's a good question. Um, that's, I generally would not recommend it because there's always the possibility that the bacteria has traveled high enough up in the plant that it's in that cutting that you would take. And that's actually one of the you know, infected seedlings is one of the ways that it's passed from field to field and, and, can, and continue to spread. Can you look in the xylem? Can you tell it about the naked eye? If well, if you, see, if, you, if you do that cutting and you see a little speckle of browning, um, this picture is kind of dark and the projector isn't all that clear, but there's a little spot right in there and there's a little spot right in there. You know, if you're actually looking at the cross section, it's a lot more obvious. Um, but there is, there's, a, there's tons of bacteria at that point. Um, so, that's one of the, another one of those questions in the disease physiology is I'm trying to understand how, how is it moving up and radially within the stem and, uh, and you know, what stage, how long does it take, some of those things. But I would definitely, if you got an infected plant, I would not take cuttings from it. You probably wouldn't even survive long enough. You know, that, you know, the plant could go from perfectly healthy to completely collapsed and dead in a matter of five to seven days. Can you identify whether the plant's infected with it by like streaming? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of, one of the primary indicators um, that it's actually bacterial will is if you cut, if you come down to the bottom of the base of that stem, you cut off a, a little chunk, put it in a glass of water, let it sit for 10 to 30 minutes, and you look, you'll see this milky white stream coming out of the bottom, and that's actually the, the bacterial oozing out. Um, because your fungal wilts, like your verticillium and your fusarium, those will also cause browning and wilting, but they don't do so. All right, thank you. All right.